The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Amen, amen, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son always remains. If the son frees you, then you are truly free. I know you are descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no room among you. I tell you, what I have seen in my father's presence. Then do what you have heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Our father is Abraham. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You are doing the works of your father. So they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and am here. I did not come on my own, but he sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. You didn't actually think winter was over, did you? (laughs) Danielle, Mashiel, and Azariah, otherwise known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're really the same people. Uh, Obviously, uh, Daniel, uh, Mishael, and Azariah would be their Jewish names. Presume, don't know for sure, these would be the names that they were given in exile when they came into the service of the king. Again, the readings are paired today intentionally because it really is a call to faith. You certainly can see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed and trusted with confidence and distinct clarity in their God. They were not proclaiming fidelity to a religion. They were proclaiming a fidelity to God. They were not simply wearing a coat, so to speak, of devotion or religious practice, self-justification by the keeping of rules. Uh, For instance, in the case of, of Abraham, or more particularly Moses. But again, look at the clarity There is no need for us to defend ourselves before you. If our God, whom we serve, can save us, then let him save us. But if he can't, or if he he will not, then we will still nonetheless not serve your God. That's the freedom Jesus is talking about. Those to whom Jesus is speaking are thinking of temporal freedom. Perhaps they forgot their history. They personally may not have been in slavery, but their ancestors were enslaved for 400 years. They're thinking temporally. We're free to do what we want. Daniel and his companions are talking about a spiritual freedom. Now, it's interesting that Nebuchadnezzar's face became livid with utter rage. Wow, I wonder what his blood pressure was. Why is he so mad? 
Did he really believe in that golden calf as God? Would it be fair enough to say that that golden calf was simply a projected image of his own ego? I'd say that's right to say, which is why he's so mad. You won't bow down to my statue. Bow down to my statue. In other words, you won't bow down to me. You won't bow down to my power. Huh? On you. So this fire is not hot enough. I'm going to make it as hot as I can, so you really suffer. Deluded in darkness. But then, of course, the image. Some say the fourth is like a son of, is like the son of man. Uh, one piece of red. It's an angel. There is a difference, but nonetheless, God heard their prayer. Can God? God can do anything God wants. Will God? I can't make that promise. Maybe it's God's will or wisdom that we continue to struggle with the trials that are ours only for the sake of our own salvation. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, hey, no matter what, whether our God saves us or not, we are not bombing down to that statue. That's clarity. It's conviction. It seems like Jesus, not unlike the Jews, kind of got his dander up a little bit here. But again, be mindful that Jesus is trying to save them. He's trying to awaken them to an interior faith. We are descendants of Abraham and have never been a slave to anyone. And you say we will become free? He's talking about spiritual freedom. Now, again, it's probably not real nice to say anyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Are we not slaves to sin? Sorry. All the things you never thought you'd do, but you did anyway. All the things that any of us do, I'll raise my hand first, that we do, and I never thought I'd do that, or just the daily sin. Well, you know, everybody does it. Well, it doesn't mean it's not a sin. It just means everybody's doing it. We're slaves to sin because we do things we don't want to do, and we do things in, intentionally or otherwise that we don't have control over. St. Paul, it's Romans chapter 7, I think, verse 20 and 21. Why do I do what I hate, and I do not do that which is what I desire? I am unable to do the good that I desire, and I do the evil that I do not desire to do. What a wretched man I am, Paul says. You can look it up. If I'm incorrect, let me know. I might be. I made a mistake once. No, wait, I was wrong. Maybe the message is softer if we put a little humor to it. But we're all sinners, and we're not free in our sin. Again, the verse strikes me, no slave stays in the house forever. You're right. Workers don't stay in the house. They stay in the worker's house or the slave house or they go home and, and to their place. But the son remains forever. The son of, of, the son of God, Jesus. And if the son, Jesus, frees you, you'll truly be free. And it's a spiritual freedom. It doesn't mean we're going to be freed from every trial and distress of this world. It means, hopefully, despite the distress and, and, and challenges of such things, we will still know and embrace the realization of our freedom in Christ. Because we're already forgiven. I know it's hard to believe the world is such a mess, and it's uh, probably not uh, helpful to complain about it all the time because it's always been a mess. That's why we have, why we needed, and have been given a Redeemer. Our fathers Abraham. If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. Kind of like Nebuchadnezzar. They're more in love with the idea of Abraham, perhaps, rather than Abraham himself, and following the way of Abraham. What is the way of Abraham? If you, were doing, if you were following Abraham, you would do his works. What was the work of Abraham? To believe, to have faith. Jesus doesn't put it in so many words. Well, he does. I'm telling you who I am as the truth of God, and you will not believe. 
I am a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. And they reject it. It would be a work of Abraham for them to believe in him. What's the takeaway? It is true that we're not free. We think of ourselves as free, but again, I'll raise my hand first. I know there's things in my life that I'm not free from, whether they're emotions or personal habits or mannerisms or attitudes or dispositions, things that pick at my, my sensibility of one way or another and, and grind my teeth or however that works out. You will have those things too. That's okay. You don't have to raise your hand and tell us. But we all have them. But the point is, Romans chapter 6 maybe, Paul, be dead to your sin and alive for God in Christ. I'm sorry we can't stop sinning. I wish I could. I'm doing the best I can. And I depend on grace. And I try to be as honest as I can with the Lord about my sin. Do I always feel free? No. Do I believe I am free? Yes, I do. And I feel it often enough, effectively, emotionally, psychologically, and mostly spiritually, that I am free, <laughs> despite myself. It's interesting how so much scripture just fits together. I uh, said a mass over at uh, Bishop Foley yesterday. They have mass once a week on Tuesdays. In the opening song, I never heard the song before. I don't know the name of the song, but it started out with that verse from Corinthians. Oh, I guess it's a scripture day. Corinthians, I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He who did not know sin became sin, so that we could know the righteousness of God. They're common words, but think about what they mean. Jesus did not just put on the coat of our sin to see if it fit or if he could manage it. He became them. Big difference. Big difference. We, in a sense, can wear the coat of religion. We can practice a religion, and we can hold the language and the idealism of a faith. But do we allow ourselves to become that faith, to become what we believe in? Jesus became sin. And again, as I like to say, it's the physics, it's the dynamic of how or why redemption works. Because he took it into himself. He became that. That was the, the complaining in the garden. But Father, how can I separate myself from you? In the communion and union of love that we have, how can I separate myself from you by taking on and becoming all this sin? But then still says, not my will, your will be done. He seems like he's a little testy here. You are, not, you are doing the works of your father. Who's he referring to? The devil. The evil one. And they pick it up, and they say something snarky right back. We are not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. Again, it's not to be doubted, but they don't know the God they believe in. As we move closer to the grace and blessing and challenge of Holy Week, look in the mirror when you get home. Remind yourself that you're free. Sin is not the first or the last word about your life. God still thinks you're a good idea. He died to save and set you free. And if you profess that and proclaim it, and you try to take that in as deeply as you can through the course and the years of your life, you are in fact free. Because when you get to the other side, nothing's going with you except your faith and your love. Again, Paul. There are, in the end, three things, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is love. None of the rest is going to the other side. My friends, you and I, in Christ, are free.